Quick note to our listeners, we need your help. We're close to 1 million views on YouTube, and we have over 5,000 subscribers. But if we can get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this year, that will allow us to raise money for the Finding Genius Foundation and our study to help those suffering from anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Please just take a second and subscribe to the podcast. And if you can, like the video. That'll help us get more listeners. It'll help with the YouTube algorithm. And again, help us reach our goal of 10,000 subscribers and 1 million views. We're going to hit the 1 million views, it looks like, hopefully by May of 2022. But the 10,000 subscribers will be harder. That's going to take until the end of this year. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast and the Finding Genius Foundation. Today's podcast is going to be a recounting of my field trip that I took with my wife to Oklahoma City about a month ago. We visited the Museum of Osteology, and from that visit, uh, I took about 160 photos and spent a few hours there and bored my wife to death, but I really enjoyed it. And I I had a series of observations that came from what I saw. So that's why I put together this book that contains seven of these observations and 31 photos and some description of what I saw. So let's talk about that now. So the Museum of Osteology uh, was created by Jay Villamoret. Uh, He has assembled over 350 skeletons from all over the world. He spent 40-plus years collecting and preserving skeletons. His story is told once you go into the museum. So I thought that was really cool that, you know, a regular old guy would uh, take his interest and make a museum out of it. And it's a pretty pretty cool place. I mean, there's two floors. If you take your time and look at everything, you could easily spend two hours there. Easy. Going through all the stuff. It doesn't look very big from the outside, but... It's got a lot of great stuff inside. One really cool thing is uh, Jay had his head scanned, and he has a replica of his skull there. When you first look, you go, oh, no, he died. But then you look again, and you go, oh, oh, he's still alive. But it was weird to have that there. And I think it would be weird to sit there and contemplate and look at your own skull. It would be very, very interesting to do. Anyway, so let's get into this. Um, one of the inscriptions when you first go in there, introduction, it says, a lifelong fascination with all things bones, a four decades long hunt for the specimens of 2,500 species past and present, an unwavering desire to preserve, appreciate, and display this rich history of life on earth. These things led to the establishment of the largest privately held collection of osteological pieces in the world, a place where science displays are more like works of art, capturing the attention of every eye that lands upon them, and telling a profound story without uttering a single word. I'm Richard Jacobs, and this is my casual trip with my family to a bone museum. Again, that sparked a number of observations that I found too intriguing not to share. Enjoy, and please 
Never stop being curious. Never stop asking questions. The good ones can lead to the greatest discoveries of mankind. So follow me into the museum. Observation number one, power of connection. So looking at various animals, elk, deer, tigers, etc., I noticed that antlers, horns, tusks, claws, certain teeth, and other skeletal characteristics, they grow continuously straight from the internal skeleton to the external body. There's no break in between. But there's a sudden dramatic change in the composition and structure of the bone. So I thought that was amazing. I don't know what I could have possibly thought, how a claw or a horn could connect inside the body to the rest of the body. Again, I just never thought about it until I went to this museum. But when I saw that the connections were essentially seamless, I thought that was really, really interesting. So a few pictures displaying that. Then I want you to imagine that you have horns protruding directly out of your skull. They're, they're a part of your skull, directly linked, just like a buffalo or an oryx. Uh, these horns, again, are a just direct extension of your skeleton. The inside of you, skeleton, now seamlessly comes out to the outside. So if you think about it, when you're looking at an oryx or a yak or one of these animals, and you're seeing its horns, you're literally seeing its skeleton. I don't think anyone has realized that. The bone is, you know, looks dramatically different, different color, different texture, different thickness and shape and everything, but it's it's still bone. So it's weird to think like, wow, I'm seeing this creature's skeleton on the outside. So that was one realization I had. And, hey, maybe it's obvious, but I just thought it was uh, it was pretty cool. Now I want you to consider the strength and the power behind horns and claws and, and things like that and how much damage they can inflict upon a person or another creature. These are not like fingernails like we have that could easily be torn off even though they can do damage. You know, imagine claws, horns, antlers, all that stuff directly integrated. It's part of your skeleton. Imagine you hitting someone with your head and you get a big set of horns on and you're hitting them with your entire skeleton all linked, your whole body. That would give you tremendous power and an immense amount of pressure would be required to break these bones. But again, the power, now you can see why animals are a heck of a lot stronger than we are, especially when they have these upgrades to their skeleton. Now, observation number two, normal versus cancerous bone growth. So I saw the areas of bone that are continually growing, like the horn area of a rhinoceros, you know, rabbit or rodent teeth. They look spongy and porous versus normal bone. Normal bone may be smooth, you know, may have features on it, but these are very porous. They look like bone sponges. So I thought that was very interesting. And then I noticed when I looked, uh, they had some skeletons that had cancerous growths on the skeleton itself, like craniofacial osteosarcoma. I'm sure a terrible thing to have. But uh, this had the exact same spongy and porous appearance. So I thought that was really interesting. Bone cancer and growth areas look very similar. So that lends credence to and supports the fact that you know cancer is uh, is uncontrolled or very rapid growth. And you can see that by looking at you know, the composition of these things. They're, they look very, very similar. So I thought that was very interesting. Because this also support the fact that the cells that make up these high growth areas, these spongy areas, are not fixed. Perhaps they move around, again, like a sponge may. You know, the cells may be more fluid on the areas that grow a lot more. They're not going to be fixed into a matrix for too long because they're going to be dividing, and the dividing cells, at the very least, will be growing into the new matrix continuously. So they're a lot more mobile than other cells. Observation number three, the bones to a skeleton are like a chassis to a vehicle. So I realized a skeleton is like the chassis or the frame of a car. That's what all the other parts are built upon. Put the seats in it, put the, you know, the body over it, the hood, all that stuff. But you have the underlying chassis, just like creatures have skeletons. And this chassis can serve a lot of different purposes with very similar looking bones. So you get birds that can fly and fish that can swim. Uh, you've got snakes slithering along the ground. You have uh, people walking around on two legs, gorillas. Then you have cheetahs that can go 80 miles an hour in short bursts. So think about it. This same chassis can allow you to fly, to swim underwater, to run 80 miles an hour. I mean, to walk upright, it's amazing all the things it can do. So I, I just thought that's amazing. You know, again, the bones don't look that different. Each skeleton, you have a head, you have a body, you have usually legs and 
sometimes a tail and you've got ribs and you've got eye sockets and you've got uh, sinuses. I mean, they're all pretty similar. So this is a chassis that can do many, many things. So I just thought it's uh, very, very interesting that uh, this chassis concept. Observation number four, upgrades to the chassis. So skeletons can be upgraded in ways that make them a lot more powerful and useful. So think about animals that have protected, protective armor, like an armadillo or a turtle. Uh, these plates are anchored into the spine, which is amazing. Again, I don't know how else they could be anchored, but they're anchored directly to the spine. So very strong protection. The turtle itself, they're completely integrated. They're a soft, softer animal inside of a very hard shell. So it's just amazing the things that, uh, that bone can do. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Let's look at a buck's antlers, you know, or deer's antlers. This helps not only to distinguish the buck in the eyes of potential mating partners, you know, I guess the bigger the horns, maybe the better, or, the, you know, the right shape is more attractive. So this is bone being used for ornamental purposes. They could also be used to uniquely identify the buck you know from the buck you don't. So bone is used in that way as well. They can also signal dominance if they're big and shaped aggressively. They can also be used to fight with. So you're literally using an exterior piece of skeleton to fight. So these are all really interesting things that this part of you, you know, this bony part can do. They can probably dig up stuff on the ground and push things as well with their antlers. I'm sure they can do that. So they have a lot of uses. It's amazing. So claws, talons, horns, tusks, teeth, they're also upgrades to your skeletal chassis. Think about the thickness and the placement of your jaw and the way it hinges, the actuation of your arms and legs, the flexibility of your spine, the size of your vertebrae. These are all characteristics that are just variations on a theme but they result in radically different, amazing abilities. Again, thinking about turtles versus birds versus people versus uh, pterodactyls. Or, you know, It's just amazing all the things that similar bones and structures can do. So I have one picture in here of uh, Gila monsters. Here's another application of bone. So they have a beaded head, bumpy head, and this literally outgrowths of bone. So that's used as camouflage. Um, it's also used for other purposes, uh, I believe, sensing heat. Uh, infrared heat and things like that. So it's amazing what bony structures can do. They can be used, again, for camouflage, for, you know, it creates like a reticulated kind of pattern on the, the animal's head, uh, allowing it to camouflage itself. So bone is, uh, again, uh, there's just more and more applications as I look. Um, then I looked at rattlesnakes. So their tail itself is integrated into their spinal chassis. Their whole body, they, they're a series of like hundreds of ribs. It's like one long spine with a head on it and a tail on it. That's what the snake looks like with, again, hundreds of, of thin ribs. So it's amazing to see that and how many it has versus how many the person has, for instance, you know. And then I consider the rattle of a rattlesnake. There's a picture of a western diamondback. So that, too, is integrated into the skeleton. But now you have bone acting as a warning. It makes sound. It's deliberately engineered to do that. And the speed and intensity and the sound it creates serves as a warning to other animals. So, very, very interesting. Observation number five, super thin supports. So some birds and some rodents, when you look at their bones, they're so thin, it looks like string. I mean, if you popped one of these creatures in your mouth, you can go crunch, 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 and probably eat it without a problem. <laughs> Yet, even though it would be easy to crush these guys, these super thin bones give them a skeleton, and it's enough to make them move around and run around and fly around and do all kinds of amazing things, amazing things. And the bones are so thin. Again, you, could, you couldn't you could even use them as toothpicks in certain cases. So I just thought that was really cool how delicate and how beautiful 
some of these bones are compared to like whale bones, how huge they are, but it's still bone and it still has the same function. So again, think of a bone a millimeter thick or less and other animals, the bone could be a foot wide or more like on whales. So bones are just incredible. Skeletons are just absolutely incredible and, uh, and diverse. I just thought that was really cool. Uh, observation number six, no surprise, but critical bone mass. So a lot of the creatures I saw, it looks like, just by eye, a lot of bone mass is dedicated to the head, probably about 50%. Uh, it makes sense because you got to, you know, have the eyes and house them, the nose, the mouth, the ears, and the brain. So the bones here have to be, you know, guarding the, the fortress or the citadel the most valuable real estate in the whole creature. So it makes sense that you dedicate a lot of thickness and a lot of strength to a skull. Very, very interesting. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Okay, observation number seven. Sinuses. There's a lot of commonality between all creatures. And again, another thing I saw was looking at the sinuses. So pretty much every skull I saw had holes in it, had sinus holes. This allows for you know, for the creature to breathe, to respond to changes in pressure and sense them, and for probably a whole bunch of other features that I don't even know what the purpose is, um, you know, for blood and nerves to go through, I guess, to get to other areas of bone that would otherwise be inaccessible. So sinuses are uh, are pretty amazing. And again, you know, so what? It's a hole in a skull. But I noticed them in every skull I looked at. I just thought it was really, really cool. And then uh, there was some bonus photos. So there was a coyote skull up near the front that had all these maggots all over it. That's how they clean skulls. That's one way that, uh, you know, opportunistic bacteria and bugs and all kinds of stuff will uh, will take a corpse and pick it clean, even down to the bones. So there's nothing but just pure white bone left. It's amazing. So there's a picture here of uh, thousands of flesh-eating dermestid beetles. And they can clean a skull of the size shown in a day or two, which is amazing. They totally clean it. So by doing it, they take all the remaining bits of dead or decaying flesh, they recycle them, and you get a fresh new look there. It's amazing. Another cool thing I saw was a skeleton of a child, and there was one uh, at, uh, I believe, 30-some-odd weeks of gestation. And at that point, uh, the baby had 100 more bones than an adult does, which is amazing. So I learned as the human skeleton develops, uh, certain bones fuse, which form the larger bones of the body. It's been interesting. Why do some fuse and some don't? Where's the plan that governs all that? You know, if it's in the DNA, where in the DNA? Where's the gene for making sure like these bones fuse and these other bones don't? Where the pancreas goes on the left side and the liver goes on the right side, etc. You know, where is that? I have no answer yet from the people I've interviewed. So. This is interesting. As an organism grows, the number of bones it has will decrease, typically. But the bones will increase in strength and size. So, interesting. So, thanks to a collaboration in your body and everyone's body of muscle, tendon, ligaments, especially in the human body, they have a skeleton here doing some yoga, which is pretty cool. It's interesting to see the skeleton uh, move in all those ways. And then uh, another picture I saw was a, uh, a three-banded armadillo. He was all rolled up in a ball, but they had the skeleton of it. So it was pretty cool to see the outer housing of the armadillo and how the skeleton folded up and kind of fit perfectly into this uh, round shell. So that was really cool to see. Again, more and more and more and more purposes for bone. Just amazing. So one thing I want to talk about at the end is um, I realized at the end of this bone museum trip that someone had to design all these skeletons. I just don't think it's random. I mean, look at all of them that are using similar chassis, similar features, over hundreds of millions of years. It's not like creatures looked one way, you know, back 400 million years ago, they had three eyes and now they have two. They had five legs instead of, or three legs instead of four. I mean, you see the features of bone repeated over hundreds of millions of years. You've got some creatures here, again, that are hundreds of millions of years old, and you've got some that are totally modern. So these features have been, have been preserved over so long that tells me that nature is unlikely to be random. Because why would these same forms repeat over and over over such a long time? And if the solutions to biological problems are random, and creatures don't act deliberately to find solutions, wouldn't there be a much more greater diversity of forms? I mean, there's many ways to, you know, to solve the puzzle, whatever that puzzle may be. I mean, look at skeletons here. 
So why would you see these similar solutions again preserved over so long a period of time? These are excellent solutions. They may not be the best. I mean, skeletons and people have been criticized for quite a while by many scientists. So they're not perfect by any means. But why would these solutions exist and not others? Why wouldn't things keep optimizing and optimizing and optimizing? But they're not. So it's just amazing to contemplate the choices that nature has made. And again, I don't see these choices as random. Why do I believe that? Well, like I explained, hundreds of millions of years, variations on a theme, successful versus unsuccessful, or completely optimized skeletons. So I don't believe that neo-Darwinism can explain the tremendous amount of commonality, not only variability, but commonality we see with, with our eyes. So another thing I noticed, again, in terms of commonalities, is every skeleton of every creature had two eyes, not one eye, not three eyes. You know, I know spiders have eight eyes, but most creatures only have two eyes. That's it. And the eyes are usually not, they're not positioned randomly on the body. You know, one's in the leg, one's in the back. They're always in the head. They're always oriented in the same direction. You know, some will go out to the sides more on cows. And, you know, you have chameleons, of course, where they move around. But they're still kind of in the same spot. They're not, again, random all over the place. And there's usually two of them. All the creatures that I saw here have a, you know, a liver or a liver equivalent, a pancreas, pancreas equivalent, even number of arms and legs, not odd number, the list goes on and on. So I think there's tons of commonalities in all these creatures, and I believe there's a good reason for this. Cellular intelligence. I don't think cells are machines. I don't think they're stupid. Uh, I think they are amazing engineers. So... Again, the entire body of every creature I saw in this bone museum and every creature I've ever seen looks highly designed. So who or what designed it? And the answer is debatable. And some people go the religious you know, way. Some people will stay away from that. Both ways are totally fine. You've got to make up your own mind. But I just, you know, I'm just telling you my feelings, my thoughts, my opinions. And I feel that randomness could not possibly have designed us and designed all these creatures. It's just not possible. Uh, randomness is not nearly that smart from what I've seen. I've never seen any human use randomness to, to design anything that was super cool or useful. It was all deliberate engineering and design that took a lot of work and effort. So, again, just to drive the point home, have, have cars been designed by randomness or airplanes? Was Microsoft Office designed by randomness? What about GPS? You know, all these things had to be deliberately engineered by a mind with intelligence. And when I see all the forms that these cells take, that they turn into bone and turn into all these other tissues and make all these creatures that can do all these things, that's massive intelligence. That's amazing intelligence to be able to do all that stuff. Why, you know, okay, look, if it's survival of the fittest, why did some creatures stay in the ground and some fly? Why did some go into the ocean? You know, they didn't have to do all that, yet they do. And to evolve in that direction from being a land animal to becoming a flying animal or vice versa, not so easy. You know, there's a big difference there. Anyway, one thing I saw, again, in, in all these skeletons was the intelligence of cells and especially of bone cells. So let's say, you know, God forbid you, you lost your leg and you had to get a prosthetic. They can't have a prosthetic that anchors perfectly to your bone. There's always chafing. There's always misalignments, etc., Bone manages to go from the inside right to the outside seamlessly, and you can seal off where it comes from inside to outside. There's no leakage, there's no problem, there's no infection. That is incredibly difficult to do as well, you know, if you do implants and stuff like that. So I, I just think it's an amazing problem that cells have engineered and solved. I think it's amazing. What I see is that cells respond to their external environments on a continuous adaptive basis because they want to keep themselves alive, happy, fed, and capable of reproducing. And cells are concrete. Nature is nebulous, whatever nature means. And so is natural selection. Where is natural selection? What's the equation for it? Who has seen it work? No one. So that's why I have a problem with it. I see ample evidence that, again, cells have their own level of cognition, no matter how alien this thinking is or this way of thinking is to a human's way of thinking. I mean, guess what? We're all made of cells, yet we're cognitive, but our cells are not. It doesn't really make sense. So from years of reading in the sciences and talking with and learning from, 
3,000 plus scientists, a particular doctor turned evolutionary biologist, Bill Miller Jr., from him I've learned that cells are the true engineers. Cells are the intelligent beings that carry out all the necessary instructions to form an entire being, including the size and shape and placement of every single organ and tissue in the body, starting with a single cell. So my observations at the Bone Museum, they reinforced for me the idea that there's incredible intelligence in the design of everything that is alive. And to me, that's a really cool thought. So thus endeth the field trip. Thank you for listening. If you like this, please like and subscribe and rate and review us on iTunes and wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.